backupping, archiving, both terms for storing data, but are two very different things. This is the Digital Prepper, and today I'm going to be talking about the differences between backing up your data, archiving your data, the differences, and when you should use each one. On the surface, backups and archives are fairly similar, but they each serve different purposes. A backup is essentially a copy of your regularly accessed data, like your applications, documents, and other data that's available for when you experience any kind of data loss. This means that you can bring in your backup to recover any of that lost data at any time. An archive, on the other hand, consists of data you do not access regularly. This can be items like photos, completed documents, or anything else that you don't want to delete, and more importantly, is not going to be changed in the near future. This data is moved to a separate storage device for long-term retention. It can still be accessed when need be, although maybe not quite as easily as a backup, depending on your storage methods. Let's talk about some examples. Some examples of backups include nightly backup of all of the files on your laptop or desktop to an external hard drive, or all of your photos on your iPhone being copied to iCloud in case you drop your phone or anything else happens to it. In the corporate world, we also have backup file servers. This may hold files that staff use daily and databases that are an organized collection of structured information. Think like a file that has a list of names and addresses, for example. Archives, however, are a bit different. Where the purpose of a backup is to put something back to how it looked previously, an archive can serve multiple purposes. The most common purpose is to help you find some data from a long time ago. It could be a single file that had a really important item on it, such as a contract you might have signed several years ago, or it could be related to a group of data such as all of your medical information that you might have stored. An archive would help you accomplish all of these tasks. Another example would be a business that might keep current contracts and orders online, but they also keep all of them in their archive, which also has an index to retrieve orders and contracts through the content of those orders. Now, you might be thinking, why does any of this matter? What's the difference between archiving and backing up your data? Well, the benefit of archiving your data that doesn't change much is that it no longer has to be a part of your regular backup system. Because this data is archived, you really don't have to do too much to it other than preventative maintenance. The benefit of backing up your data is that at any time you'll have a recent copy of what is being backed up in case of any unforeseen event happening. Now, let's get to the fun part. What do we use when we want to archive our data? Since long-term storage is what we're looking for, you want to store your archived data on a storage medium that will last for as long as possible. Since different storage mediums have different life expectancies, as well as other pros and cons, we'll take a look at some popular options and compare them. Starting with hard disk drives, they're the most common type of storage medium, and they are cost effective as well, ranging anywhere from about $30 to $50 per terabyte for most external hard drives and the benefit is you can fit a lot of data onto a single drive. The only real downsides are that the drives themselves can't really take up a lot of physical space, especially if you have full-size three and a half disk drives. They can be delicate with all of the moving parts inside, so do treat them with care. You might also be concerned about a hard drive's lifespan, but since it will be in cold storage and unused, it should technically last for quite a while. The normal range is about 15 years. However, do make sure just to plug them in and turn them on every year or two to keep the moving parts inside from locking up. Next up, we have flash storage. This could be solid state drives, USB flash drives, even micro SD cards. They can be good candidates for archiving your data but it's not necessarily too cost effective. For example, you can buy a 256 gig flash drive that will cost you about $30. 
you would be paying a lot of money buying multiples of those compared to hard disk drives. However, the long-term lifespan of flash storage is not quite as well known as it is for hard drives since flash storage hasn't been around too long. But after doing some research, I've had flash drives continue to work perfectly after 10 or so years. So the potential is definitely there. Do be aware though, USB flash drives can withstand between 10,000 to 100,000 write erase cycles. What this means is every time you plug in your flash drive and either save data to it or move data from it, that can decrease the life cycle of the flash drive, depending on the memory technology used on it. When this limit is reached, some portion of that memory may not function properly and it can lead to lost or corrupted data. Finally, we have disks. Now I'm just going to lump all of these into kind of the same category, but what I mean when I say that are things like Blu-ray DVDs and normal DVDs. They can be great for general storage of data as long as you have a writable Blu-ray disk drive and you really can put any file you want onto a Blu-ray disk for example. The cost is pretty good. A example is a stack of 50 writable Blu-ray discs at 25 gig each cost you about $22. And the total storage you would get from that stack would equal about 1.25 terabytes. Obviously you would need a Blu-ray writer. Doing research on those, they cost about $90. So there is some added upfront cost there. But if you don't mind having all of your files on discs, this is not a bad option to consider, as the average lifespan of Blu-rays and DVDs are about 20 to 50 years. Now, no matter which option you do choose, you will be required to perform maintenance every now and again on your data. Don't expect to just put all of your data on a hard drive and then put it in a box for 50 years and say, I'm all set. For starters, you will want to make sure that you keep your archives in a climate controlled environment. More meaning that it's away from heat and humidity. This will keep your media from degrading too quickly. Because of this, it is recommended to keep your archive in a safe deposit box, or if you can manage it, somewhere that is safe, possibly offsite and climate controlled. With hard drives specifically, it's a good idea to take them out of their storage about every year or two and turn them on to prevent their moving parts from locking up. By this time, you will likely have more files to add to your archive anyway, so this time will be a great time to add those to your existing collection. Finally, do prepare for the possibility that the interfaces that your media currently use might eventually disappear. For example, if you have files archived on a USB flash drive, the current USB format might change or might not exist several years from now. And you will have a hard time finding a device that you'll be able to plug the flash drive into. Because of this, it is a good idea to audit the types of media that you'll be using for your archive every once in a while and make any changes if need be, or be ready with some type of converter or adapter so that you can keep your access to your data intact. Passports, identification numbers, medical papers. These are all very important documents that most, if not all of us have. You probably have them stored in some sort of envelope in the closet or a file cabinet. But what happens if something happens to these physical documents? Do you have a plan for your documents in case of disaster? This is The Digital Prepper, and today we're going to look at ways you can prepare by backing up your most important documents. One question you might be asking yourself is why should I back up my documents digitally? Well, as preppers, you should always have backups. You probably have extra gas stored, food, water, and other items. Having backups of your physical documents in a digital format is an excellent way to prepare in case of any sort of disaster. One popular wisdom for preppers is that two is one and one is none, meaning that you always want to have a backup of whatever it is that you have in case of something happening. 
This should also apply to any physical documents that you have. Various circumstances can happen. Depending on your location, there could be many types of things that could happen. Earthquakes, fires, tornadoes. And because you would have set yourself up with this form of redundancy, there's more of a chance for you to be better off when disaster happens. Finally, it's just easier to bring along an external hard drive or USB flash drive rather than a stack of files and small cards that can easily get lost, especially if your documents were not organized. So right about now, you're probably thinking, okay, I wanna back up my physical documents. Which document should I back up first? Well, in reality, you can store whatever you have the space for, but let's start with the most important documents. In my opinion, I would say anything that you can think of that may be important, tedious, or even impossible to reobtain. Examples of this would be social security cards, passports, medical information, birth certificates, even driver's licenses. For example, in the United States, it is a very tedious process in order to reobtain social security cards if they are lost or destroyed. Some of the things that they even ask for to, in order to get that document back would be things like birth certificates and passports. And if, for example, you have lost these physical paperworks in a disaster, but you had them in a digital format, you could use these to assist with getting that paperwork back. Other examples of things that would be impossible to get back are things like family photos. A lot of people like to print out their family photos, place them all over the house. But if something happened, like a fire, those photos would not be able to be recovered, but you would have them digitally backed up to print at a later time. So what are some ways to convert physical documents to digital files, and how do you store them? Well, converting them is the easy part. You can use a scanner for most paperwork or cards. If you don't have a scanner, there are various phone applications that can take a photo of a document and convert it into a PDF automatically. You would then just put these files on your computer. I would not advise utilizing public spaces like copy shops or even libraries. I wouldn't even be comfortable bringing those kinds of files outside my own home. Once you have these documents digitized, how do we store them? Well, we have a few options that we can utilize. The first are USB flash drives. The benefits to using these are first, they are small devices, so they can be stored or hidden in more places than any of the other options. They can also store a lot of information depending on the size that you purchase. The only downside that I could see with these is that some of them can be broken quite easily. The next option that we have would be external hard drives. In some aspects, especially with today's technology, you could honestly say that they are just larger flash drives, especially since most of them use solid state technology. This would be a better option as a lot of external hard drives are designed to be carried around or stored, and some of them are even designed to deal with possible hazards like falling from high heights. The only downside I can see with these is that they can be a little bit more expensive. Finally, we have Network Attached Storage, or NAS. These are more bulkier drive arrays, meaning that they are built already with redundancies by having more than one hard drive built into them. These Network Attached Storage can have as little as two hard drives to as many as four or more. This can mean that in case of a hard drive failure, it would already have backed up your data to another one of its hard drives. You can then just get a replacement hard drive and replace it out and it would automatically back up your data. The benefits to these are that they can possibly store more than the other two options combined. They can also be set up on your home network meaning that you'll have access to your files from anywhere in your home on your computer. Some of them even have settings to allow you to access these files from anywhere. Obviously, while this is a great benefit, you do need to be aware that because this can be on your home network, 
it is possible that if someone hacked your computer, they can gain access to your files. Another drawback to this option is that it can be the most expensive of the three. Now that you have your documents digitally backed up, here are some ways to keep them safe. One thing you can do is put your files in organized folders and then place passwords on them. If you have questions on how to manage passwords, take a look at our previous video on how to manage your passwords. If you are using a network access device, just make sure that when you set it up not to keep the default username or password. Again, hackers will try the easiest way to access your data because they already assume that people are lazy and put the easiest usernames and passwords on their data. When you delete a file, it isn't really erased. It continues to exist on your hard drive even after you've emptied it from the recycle bin. If you're not careful, this can allow other people to recover your confidential files, even if you think you've deleted them. This is the Digital Prepper, and today I'll be talking about deleted files, how they can be recovered, and how you can prevent it. Let's first talk about what actually happens when you delete a file from your computer. Windows and other operating systems keep track of where all of your files are on a hard drive through things called pointers. Each file and folder on your hard drive has a pointer that tells the operating system where the file's data begins and ends. When you delete any file from your machine, your operating system removes the pointer from the file and marks those sectors containing the file's data as available. When this is complete, from the operating system's point of view, the file is no longer present on your hard drive and the sectors containing its data are basically considered free space for other files to fill in. Until you or the operating system actually writes new data over those sectors that contain the contents of the file, the file will still be recoverable. A file recovery program such as Recuva can scan a hard drive for these deleted file sections and restore them. If the file has been partially overwritten with data, then obviously the file recovery program can only recover part of the data. One major point before I move on is that none of this applies to solid state drives or SSDs. When you use SSDs, deleted files are actually removed immediately and they can't actually be recovered. What happens is that the data can't be overwritten onto the flash cells that are on the SSD. And in order to be able to write new data, the contents of the flash memory have to be erased first. Your operating system automatically does this to speed up the write performance of the drive. But if it didn't erase the data immediately, then basically the entire SSD would have to be erased before being written to. And over time, this would make writing more data to the solid state slower, which wouldn't be good. Now, before I go over how to securely delete files from your PC, let's take a bit of time to take a look at how you can recover your own files if you've accidentally deleted something. If you've accidentally deleted a file and need to get it back, there are some things that you should bear in mind. One is that you should recover the file as soon as possible. As your operating system continues to write files to your hard drive, the chances of it overwriting the deleted files increases. If you want to be sure that you can recover the file, you should perform a recovery immediately. The second thing is that you should try to use the hard drive as little as possible. The best way to recover a deleted file from a hard drive is first powering off your computer immediately after the file is deleted, inserting the hard drive into another computer using an operating system that is running on another hard drive in order to recover it. Now, you don't have to do this, but if you don't, you do need to work fast because if you try to recover a file by, for example, installing a file recovery program on the same hard drive, then the installation process and the normal use of the hard drive can overwrite your file. So maybe go and install the program now, just in case. Speaking of applications, 
Windows does not actually include a built-in tool that scans your hard drive for deleted files, but there are a wide variety of third-party tools that do do this. I personally use Recuva for this. It is made by the same developers of CCleaner, and this utility can scan a hard drive for deleted files and allow you to recover them. I'll leave a link to the program in the description so you can do additional research and figure out if it's good for your own use. Okay, so let's move on to actually deleting files. First, let's ask why would you need to permanently delete your files from your computer? Well, for example, with the entire shift to hybrid and work from home models, a lot of people that do work from home use their personal computers to do a lot of the work that they need to do. This could cause you to download confidential or private data on your computer, such as financial documents and other sensitive pieces of information. And you might be worried that someone could recover your deleted files. You can remove the free space from that hard drive a variety of ways. One of them you can use is the drive wiper utility from CCleaner. This wipes your hard drive's free space by writing other data over the free space on your hard drive, then all of your deleted files will be permanently erased. If you're looking to only fully delete one particular file, you can use a file shredding application like Eraser to do this. When you use this utility, not only is the file deleted, but its data is overwritten entirely, which prevents other people from recovering it. Do be aware that this may not always protect you. For example, if you have made a copy of the file and deleted the original at some point, another deleted copy of that file may still be on your hard drive. Also, using this particular utility takes longer than deleting a file normally, so it would be a bad idea to try and delete every single file you need to this way. It's really only necessary for like a specific confidential file. Finally, if you're wanting to completely wipe your entire hard drive, maybe you're going to give a computer to someone else or you just want to trash the hard drive. Again, there is a third party tool that does this. DBAN, which stands for Derek's Boot and Nuke, is a disk wiping program that will erase everything from your hard drive, including your operating system and all of your personal files, overwriting them with useless data. You can run this program as many times as you like, however, you only need to run it once in order for it to do the job. Do note that this can take a matter of hours depending on the size of the drive. Again, all of the links to these programs will be in the description. With all this being said, I hope now you will understand why deleted files can be recovered and how to stay safe when actually deleting your files. Remember all these tips next time you're getting rid of a computer or hard drive as your confidential files may still be present on the hard drive if you haven't properly erased them. We use the internet for everything. Watching videos, saving files, playing games, planning trips. But what happens when you don't have access to the internet? What happens if you don't have access to the internet for a prolonged period of time? Do you have the applications that you would need saved in your digital vault? This is the Digital Prepper, and today we're going to be looking at some important applications that I think you should have saved in some sort of digital vault in case of a internet outage or some other SHTF scenario. Before we get started, there are some things that I would like to mention. One is that all of these suggestions are of my own opinion. Please leave a comment down below if you can think of any other better applications to keep saved in your digital vault. Two is that we're gonna be mostly talking about computer applications However, this could be repurposed for mobile devices as well. And finally, I would recommend using open source programs than ones that are closed sourced. What open source refers to is that the program itself is publicly accessible, meaning that if you do have the skills, you could have access to the source code and would be able to use or edit the code to do things like fix bugs, 
or even potentially make something new from the current code. With that being said, let's take a look at some applications. One of the first kinds of applications that I would say is needed would be some sort of audio slash video player. This would be something that would make it so that in case of a SHTF scenario, you would be able to access any of your media files such as movies or music albums that you might have saved in your digital stores. This could be for entertainment or you might have things like recipes or how to's stored in a video format. An example of this type of application would be something like VLC. VLC is a free and open source multimedia player that plays most media files or DVDs, audio CDs, and the like. This program can be used on multiple platforms, which includes Windows, Linux, and Mac, as well as even mobile devices. The second kind of application that I think would be needed would be some sort of document creator or editor. This could be like Microsoft Word, but personally, my go-to is actually a little program called LibreOffice. This, like VLC, is a open source program, and what makes this a great go-to is that it's basically Microsoft's Office suite, but free to use. It even has the other programs equivalent to Excel and even PowerPoint. It also has applications that you could use to create diagrams and databases. Now, you're probably asking yourself, well, why would I need this when I could use paper and pen? Well, there are a few reasons. One is that some preppers like myself do keep an inventory of items that they have prepared. This can include numbers of food stores and water and supplies. Using Excel to do this task makes this extremely simple and with the use of calculations and the ability to store large amounts of information within the spreadsheet is much better opposed to paper and pen. Also, these files can be saved on removable storage media like USBs and external hard drives as a backup in case something happens to your main device. This is a little bit better than having it written down on paper where it could more easily be destroyed. The third kind of application that I would recommend is actually something to assist with storing and securing your data. This would be a compression application such as 7-Zip, which is again open source. These programs are, in my opinion, really important for compressing larger files and folders, such as your video and audio files. By compressing your files, they also take up less space on all of your devices and 7-Zip also has the ability to password protect your files so that they can also be secure. So that's a bonus. The four kind of applications that I would suggest is in regards to entertainment. Now, prepping things like food, water, and ways to stay organized are very important. What's more important though is keeping a positive mental state. With low morale, it becomes hard to stay focused on your goal of getting through whatever disaster that you might be facing. And having entertainment, whether it be junk food or games, is very important to keeping your mental state well. Now, speaking of games, which would be the last kind of application that I would recommend to have in your digital vault. Normally, when you think of a computer game, you think of applications like Steam. But this is not actually what I would recommend, as Steam, for the most part, requires you to be online in order to play games. There is an offline mode that does work for the short term, but eventually it tries to phone home or ping its server that's on the cloud in order to reobtain your login information so that you can log in. If it can't do that, then you would lose access to all of your games. That being said, you also have to pay for games on that platform as well. An alternative to this would actually be to visit a site like archive.org. A link will be in the description. This is an internet archive of loads of games as well as different kinds of software, movies, 
and even old television shows. In terms of actual software for playing games, there are also things called emulators, which allow you to emulate a specific platform, like a Game Boy for example, or a Super Nintendo system. And with that, you will be able to also download and play games on that emulated platform. Finally, here's something that you might not have thought of, but depending on the scenario could be very important. And that's having backups of entire operating systems. Now you might be thinking, that sounds like a lot of space to keep for having entire operating systems. Well, depending on what operating system you want to save, that's not necessarily the case, but you can also save open source flavors of Linux if needed. Now, despite what you might have heard about Linux, Linux has actually grown to be a lot more user friendly and basically runs the same kinds of programs that other operating systems like Windows run. You could also obtain a version of Linux that runs entirely off of a flash drive. So it's actually a portable, potentially kind of disposable drive or operating system that could be used on any computer that you find. Now, once you have your applications and data, be prepared to store them and make sure that they're secure. See our previous video for more tips and tricks on how to do this. All of these applications are important to have in just the regular scenario let alone a mild inconvenience of the internet going out for a few days. In a SHTF scenario, I would definitely keep all of these and more in my digital vault to be able to be used. The Google Play Store is the place to obtain applications for your Android device. Sometimes people want alternatives. They want the option to not be tied to a large corporation that may gather your data through the applications that they have, or maybe there's something that you need that is just not on the Google App Store. This is the Digital Prepper, and today I'm going to look at five alternatives to the Google Play Store. So why would you want an alternative to the Google Play Store? Well currently if you are an Android user, you probably live under the safe umbrella of the Google Play Store. There is a good reason for that seeing that it has the most apps, good security compared to third-party app stores, it comes pre-installed on most Android devices, and it usually works pretty well. With that being said, there are a few reasons why you would need an alternative. One, there may be an app that is not on the Google Play Store that you would like to have. The Google Play Store and the App Store will remove an app, which could be one of your favorites, as soon as somebody like the government tells them to do so. Two, you may want to have a beta version or an older version of an application. I normally wouldn't recommend having an older version of an application for security reasons, as older applications may have security holes that have not been patched. However, some updates may not be desirable, and you might want to revert back to a previous patch of that application, which you cannot do with applications on the Google App Store. Getting started with the alternatives. The first one I'll talk about is F-Droid. F-Droid is a open source app store. It is one of the older app stores on the list and one of the most trustworthy. This app store runs on donations and is run by volunteers. It only allows free applications and it has a policy of not pushing applications that include paid add-ons or advertisements. There are some basic applications on there like galleries or simple calendars, along with a very small selection of games. This is more of an app store for people who need something a little extra that the Play Store doesn't have. Another good thing about F-Droid is besides the fact that in and of itself it is open source, every application on that platform is open source. You can even find alternatives to F-Droid on F-Droid. The second alternative we'll look at is APK Pure. Like F-Droid, APK Pure is also an open source place for applications, and the applications that are available on there are free, as there are no paid applications available on there. Also, with APK Pure, it does allow you to download applications that are region locked, that may not be on the Google Play Store, 
and they also have older versions of applications available as well. Next we have APK Mirror. This is not necessarily an app store, but it's more of a repository for applications. A repository is a file storage location, and it can be used to store various versions of the application, which is beneficial if you do want to use an old version of some sort of application or game. Like APK Pure, the applications on here are free of region lock. You don't have to create an account to obtain applications from here, and you can browse and download applications without any sort of registration. Finally, you can also get access to early alpha and beta versions of any of the applications that are on there. Next, we have a little bit of a different option, the Amazon App Store. This is honestly one of the best alternatives to the Google Play Store. And while you do need an Amazon account in order to have access to the store, it does provide some other benefits that the Google App Store does not. It does have both free and paid applications, and you can gain access to Amazon coins, which is basically kind of the same as Google's Google Play coins that you can use for in-app purchases if needed. Finally, we have GetJar. This is the oldest alternative and currently has over 800,000 applications. The good thing about this alternative is that it doesn't just have Android applications, it also has applications for other mobile platforms like Blackberry and Windows Mobile. So if you do have a phone that's not necessarily an Android phone, then you would still have access to obtaining applications for your device as well. Do remember that it is a good thing to have alternatives to things like the Google Play Store. It does give you more options and allows you to, if needed, not have to connect to accounts that you might not want them to have your information. This is good information for your digital preparedness. Do remember to do some research and pick whichever one of these alternatives best suits you. And I do hope that you utilize them. Now more than ever, securing your smartphone is extremely important. Your phone is an inseparable part of you. It's a digital book of your life with detail unlike anything else out there. If a hacker gains access to your smartphone, they basically have access to not only your life, but your mind. This is the Digital Prepper, and today we're gonna to be looking into what you can do to make sure your smartphone is secure and protected from hackers. Before we get started, I just want to say that this is more going to be focused on security of smartphones. I'm going to be assuming that you are a general user who faces most common threats from low resource targeted attacks, fraud, and scam attacks. Do know that smartphones do openly broadcast a lot of data, and sometimes it's impossible to use them securely in certain situations. The purpose of security is not to be invincible. The goal of security is to exhaust the resources of your threats. Finally, sometimes the concepts of privacy and security overlap, but they are different, so some of the steps I will mention will favor security at the expense of privacy. With that all being said, let's get started. The easiest one on this list would be encrypting your smartphone. For some phones, this could already be enabled by default, but for most of us, you'll need to go digging in your phone settings in order to enable this. Check your device manual for instructions on how to do this. I do believe for iOS, this may be a standard feature. With any device, I would recommend that you set a dedicated time to not have your phone be used, as the process can take up to several hours to complete. What you'll also need to do is make sure that you use a strong password, use an alphanumeric password or a code that is at least six digits long. Assuming that you do remember your passwords, you should think about setting your smartphone to delete your data after too many incorrect attempts. This will protect your phone from brute force attacks if someone steals your smartphone. However, given enough time and resources, they could bypass the encryption. Also, do note, device encryption will not protect against malware that is on your device already, 
or if someone gains access to your smartphone remotely. Do remember that both Android and iOS allow you to remotely wipe your device if it has been lost or stolen. If you do resort to this, do note that it will not wipe your SD card if you have one installed on your smartphone, so any content on there may be vulnerable. The second thing I'm going to talk about is phone updates. Most hacks, not just in smartphones, but in general, occur because the software on the device has not been updated or people are using bad passwords to access it. Hackers share this information on online forums and rely on users like you not updating your devices to be able to hit them with malware. You need to set your device to automatically download and install updates. And do note that a lot of malware doesn't stay on your phone after a reboot. So if you can go into your device settings and set your phone to reboot every night when you're not using it would help you a lot. Speaking of updates, your smartphone applications have the easiest access to all of your data. What you can do to make sure that these are safe is twofold. One, be minimalist with your apps. Don't have multiple of the same type of app. Find ones that do multiple things at once. Remember to only keep the applications that you actively use and uninstall apps that you no longer need. You're more exposed to software vulnerabilities when you have hundreds of applications on your smartphone. Hackers could exploit software vulnerabilities on applications that may not have been updated in a while. Finally, don't download or install apps from outside of the official app stores. These repositories are signed by the developers and platforms which ensures their authenticity of the applications. Do note that this does not mean that you can just blindly trust everything that you can see out there. Do your research because there have been times where an application on both the Android and iOS app stores have infected applications that have infected lots of smartphones. With applications, you should not do things on your phone without an application firewall. Sometimes smartphone applications do require tons of unnecessary permissions, and there can be malicious applications on the app stores that will steal your data when you install them. This can be prevented to a large extent by having a good application firewall. The best free and open source option is NetGuard or No Root Firewall for Android. And for iOS users, there's an application called Lockdown that will do the same thing. There are two ways that you can use firewall applications, which are you can review your applications and restrict network access to them individually. This is called blacklisting or what you can do is automatically block network access to any apps and any apps that will be installed in the future and only allow the ones that you truly need it for. This is called whitelisting. Another way to secure your smartphone and yourself online is to make sure that you are enabling two-factor authentication on your device and any websites that you visit. Most people have a Google account or a Apple ID enabled on their phones, but do remember that these accounts are only as secure as you secure them. Use strong passwords, use a two-factor authentication app that generates one-time passwords. For more information, go ahead and check out our video where I go over two-factor authentication and why you may also be using it wrong. Finally, this is something that's a little bit more simple, but do make a habit to disable Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connectivity when you're not using them. You should also disable automatic connection to both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth as hackers can easily set up a malicious network and if your phone connects to it, your device and your data can be compromised. You should be aware of every network connection that your phone makes. I would also avoid using public Wi-Fi connections unless you absolutely need to, or if you do, use a VPN to hide your traffic when connected to an open network. 
go ahead and take a look at the card on the side uh, if you need more information on VPNs and how to use them. To wrap up, let me reiterate that now more than ever, securing your smartphone is extremely important. Your phone is an inseparable part of you, and it's important to secure the data, and in a lot of cases, your livelihood is stored on these devices. I hope that these simple steps can assist you with your digital preparedness and help keep you safe. Obsolescence is defined as the process of becoming obsolete or outdated. Your preps are a part of this, and this is something that you will have to plan for. This is the Digital Prepper, and today we'll be taking a look at what planned obsolescence is, how it affects your digital preps, and how you can prepare for it. So what is planned obsolescence? Well, in the tech world or just in general, this is when companies design a product that has an artificially limited useful life or just a frail design that's purposefully set up so that it becomes obsolete after a certain predetermined period of time. Well, why would they make products like this? Why wouldn't they just make products that do last a long time that are of good quality? Well, that's simple. The companies want to make money by cycling their products when new products are made and sold, as well as forcing people to produce replacements if needed. Here are some examples that may make it a little more easier to understand. First, let's talk about Apple. In 2017, information was leaked outing that Apple was artificially slowing down older phones to drive up new sales of their newer devices. Apple came out and stated that they were doing just that, but it was designed to protect the older phones from aging batteries. People argue that Apple fully understood that by concealing these issues, it could spend a year profiting off of people who thought they needed to buy a new iPhone when they only really needed to replace their phone's battery to avoid slowness or unexpected shutdowns. Another example I'll talk about is John Deere. In 2019, their annual sales were up to $6 billion, and they stated that parts and services were three to six times more profitable than the sale of the original equipment, which can be as much as $80,000 for just one piece of farm equipment. The issue is how they built their equipment so they can force customers to make trips to register dealerships even for the smallest repairs. They built their tractors with sophisticated software, which at first glance sounds pretty cool. But then you learn that the software takes and transfers analytical data about certain statistics to their company, and they also say that you don't even own the software, that the customers buy these $80,000 machines only to receive an implied license to operate the machinery. So those are just some examples of planned obsolescence. Let's talk a little bit more about how this phenomenon can affect your digital preps. So planned obsolescence is similar to another technical term called end of life. That process is defined as a series of technical and business milestones and activities that once completed make a product obsolete. This means that both of these terms dictate the exact time in which your still operational and useful equipment will be considered waste, even if it works perfectly fine. Some things that could happen in terms of your digital preps is that first, you'll have to spend unnecessary amounts of money on upgrades when you don't have to. Another thing that could happen is that your devices may receive updates that purposefully degrade the performance of your devices, kind of like how we talked about Apple was doing in 2017. At a certain point, your devices will probably not be able to be updated anymore as the company may make the software on the device outdated, forcing you to either upgrade or deal with not having the latest updates that could compromise the security of those devices. So how can you deal with this? How can you make sure that your devices and equipment 
Don't become old and incompatible with your newer equipment. Well, technically you can't. However, there are some things you can do to make sure that you have the equipment and the things that you need. First, always have extras. The phrase two is one and one is none very much applies here. If you have, for example, a brand of hard drives or USB flash drives that you purchase and you like the brand, purchase additional ones so that if something happens to that used and old one, you'll be able to replace it with the same type that you have before and since you have it put in storage, it'll be brand new out of the box. Make sure that you have items that will allow you to have backwards compatibility with your older devices. For example, newer PCs and laptops don't normally come with DVD drives now, as technology is moving forward to more digital formats. With that, have an external USB DVD drive so that you can use the older format DVDs on your newer devices. The other thing you can do is research. Technology is always moving forward, and unfortunately this means that some newer formats are just going to be better than old ones, and the older formats are eventually going to be obsolete. This does mean that you'll have to do your research so that when you're purchasing or obtaining new technology, that you're getting something that will be durable and won't be outdated within like a year. Again, let me repeat that technology is always moving forward. This, for the most part, is a great thing, but when companies take advantage of the consumers by making flimsy products for the sake of profit, that's when you should look elsewhere. There are many applications and ways to keep yourself and your preps organized. Organization is one of the key points of preparedness, and knowing the quantity and quality of your preps helps you to stay organized, save money, and stay prepared. This is the Digital Prepper, and today I'll be going over the more popular of the inventorying applications that can be used to keep yourself organized and prepared. Before we get started, I just want to remind you guys that if you do like the video and want to discuss anything regarding digital preparedness or just preparedness in general, go ahead and leave a like comment and subscribe to see more like this. With that being said, let's get started. This is going to be more of an overview of the more popular applications that can be used to organize your preps. Do let me know in the comments if you want to see a more in-depth review of any of these products that are shown. Starting off simple, we do just have normal spreadsheet applications like Microsoft Excel, LibreOffice, or Google Sheets. Any of these will do and have been used by preppers everywhere for simplicity and ease of use. You can also use macros as well to make your spreadsheets more robust and able to handle things like automation of, let's say, color coding items that might have an expiration date, or even to remind you when you need to rotate out your stores. The highlights to using these types of applications are one, you don't need to spend that much time learning how to use spreadsheets, this is one of those things that you can either use very simply or you can get into it and make it your own with fun customizations like macros. Second, you don't need to pay a handsome amount for using them. Most of the time, they either come for free in case of open source software like LibreOffice or if you have an account with Google, Google Sheets is also free. Or most of the time, it does come with your copy of Windows in regards to Microsoft Excel. If you do want a template for a spreadsheet, they are easy to use, and a lot of them can be found with a simple Google search. And finally, if you are using something like Google Sheets, you will be able to access it online and through even your mobile devices. However, if you are not wanting your data to be online or through Google, you can avoid this method and go with something like LibreOffice or Microsoft Excel. The second application I do want to talk about is Inventory Wolf. This is a popular application for the Prepper community and is on the Google Play Store for Android as well as on the App Store for Apple devices. 
On their website, it does list a lot of features, such as having scanner access through your device's phone's camera, being customizable, and having the ability to import and export CSVs. And finally, for a fee of $1.99, you will also have access to create an account in order to back up your inventory data online onto a secure data server, as well as get push notifications for items that are expiring, and you do get unlimited items that you can add. The normal amount on the application is 50 items. It does also allow you to be able to import and export CSVs with that fee as well. The highlights to this application are, one, it is easily accessible to anyone with a smart device, and because it's on iOS and Android, you are not forced to get a device that you don't have. Second, there is a free version for you to try out, and the paid version isn't all that expensive, and the features that it does bring are worth the price. The ability to scan items into your inventory is a massive benefit for saving time and energy since the amount of work that you will need to do is drastically cut down with that feature. And finally, the issues that I have seen some preppers make are that they did have concerns with information either being sold or the permissions that the application does request. I will say that you will need to do your own research to see if this application will be a good one for you to use. However, the developer of the application has stated that they do not collect or sell any data from the application. But again, it is a valid concern that you will need to take into account. The third application I do want to get into is the Ultimate Prep System from The Prepper Nerd. This is a web application that can only be used online. However, you can print out and store information if needed. They do list a lot of features on their website, such as having a central dashboard, sections for food, supplies, and equipment, a shopping list, automatic date reminders, barcode scanning, and information syncing to all of your devices. This does come with a subscription cost of $47 per year, and if you're not satisfied, they also have a 30-day money-back guarantee for the service. Some of the highlights to this system is one, the Prepper Nerd is a well-known member of the Prepper community, and he's been backed by a lot of other preppers, so that could add to any trust issues that you might have. It does have a lot of features, so if you're looking for something that does have a lot of features, or something that you will need to be synced to all of your devices, then this might be something for you. This application is also not just for food, but can be utilized for your equipment and other supplies. There is the concern of it being fully online, and the Preppreneur does note the potential issues and the privacy and security of your data, and does state that the system is built on something called Smartsheet, which is used by larger companies to store protected health information. Now, this doesn't mean that your data can't be accessed or compromised, but this combined with secure practices from you will help keep your data safe. And finally, some people might be put off with the price of $47 a year. However, do remember that this system is built and maintained by one person, and the price is an annual one that does include a lot of features. Another application I want to showcase is something called Pantry Check. This is specifically an iOS application, and only deals with food, not other supplies. It is a free application, but it does have in-app purchases ranging from $1.99 to $29.99, so that you can increase the amount of items that you can store on the application up to a maximum of 10,000 items. It does show photos of the items that you have stored. It does have barcode scanner functionality and even lists the prices of the items that you store in case you purchase them at another time. Some of the highlights to this are one, unfortunately some people won't be able to use this application as it is iOS only. And again, this application is online based, so your information would be sent to a third party for storage of your inventory information. If you don't mind this, great. Otherwise, you would need to do research to see if this is for you or look at other alternatives. The ability for this application to add the prices and update them as they change 
can be great for future planning of purchases, whether or not you either buy more if it's on sale, or maybe you look at alternatives because the prices have gone up on your particular item. And finally, some people might be put off by the in-app purchases to add additional items because $29.99 is not a small amount of money for some people. Finally, one last application I do want to go over is Grossy. Grossy is a desktop application that can also be web hosted or installed on your mobile device. Like the other applications, it has barcode support, and even though its main use is for food preps, it could be used for other types of preps by utilizing its category fun functionality. This application is open source, which as I've gone over in other videos, is a great thing if you are savvy enough to tweak with an application source code to fix bugs or things like that. Some of the highlights are that this application is free and it does not have to be online based. However, you will lose some of the functionality like the barcode function as that does need to ping a external server to get the barcode information. Because it is open source, the community for this application has created add-ins and other tools to improve the functionality of the base application, such as in adding a home assistant add-on that would allow you to add things like a shopping list, recipes for the items that you have stored, and even to-do chores to complete. This tool is one of the more complicated ones to set up and use, However, if you do have the knowledge to set this up, you would be able to make the most use of this software. And finally, because this tool does have an active community, you would be able to reach out to them through their forums or through their subreddit for any assistance that you might need. Do remember, this is not the total list of applications that you can use for inventory management of your preps. For example, you could easily just use pencil and paper to manage your preps. The point to these kinds of applications is just to make your life easier, to keep yourself safe and prepared. If you did like the video, go ahead and give it a like and subscribe to get more videos like this that will help you with your digital preparedness. If you have any ideas for more videos or want to share your experiences with prepping, leave a comment down below. More digital prepping to come.